But I want to share a testimony. This may just be a testimony. I didn't, I didn't give my testimony a while ago because I had so many to give. But the other day I, was, I called my son, and, and my son and I, we talk, we converse quite a bit. And he told me, he said, now, Dad, he said, I've got to share something with you. He said, you know, I, I, I've, I've understood the message of grace, the message of the cross for, for years now, for about four years. And he said, but, but my wife Deidre, and y'all have all met Deidre. He said, my wife Deidre, she's saved, but she didn't really understand how I could be so full of joy and have the victory and walk with God and, and just be on the blessed side of life. It just frustrated her. That I, how, could you, how can you not worry? How, how can you not be fearful? You know, how can you walk around with a smile on your face, laughing and singing all the time? I just don't understand. You know, she just get, you know, the Bible says that we should not frustrate the grace of God. How many of you know that people that don't understand the message of grace, they stay frustrated all the time? <laughs> they stay aggravated all the time, and they just can't understand how you can be happy. You know, I used to be standing at the sink singing and whistling, praising God, and my blessed ex-wife, she'd be sitting back at the table, and she'd be telling my, one of my friends that he, I know he's got to be miserable. He, he just can't be that happy. You know, he, I'm miserable. That's what she would say. I'm miserable. I'm not going to tell you who she is, but she said, I'm just miserable. But see, I had the blessing. What, you know, Paul said, where's the blessedness you spoke of? The blessedness. What we live in is a state of blessedness. Yes. You know what I'm saying? If, if how things are going is how you're doing, you're deceived. Amen. If how things are going is how you are doing, you're deceived. Amen. Because if the devil knows that he can make your circumstances a little uncomfortable, that he knows exactly the buttons to push in your life. And he will constantly push those buttons. That's why Paul said, in whatever state I am, I have found that I am content. And the word content there in the Greek means I am independent of circumstances. I am independent of circumstances. Circumstances do not dictate my relationship with God. My, my relationship with God is independent of this world. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. There's going to be problems. The enemy is going to come try to steal your faith. But you have to live independent of your circumstances. You can't let it dictate your relationship with God. For the kingdom of God is not, it's not meat or drink. It's not your circumstances. It's not how things are going in your relationships. It's not how people treat you. Because you know what? Most people are not going to treat you right. And if, if the way you treat me determines my life, then you become my Lord and not Jesus my Christ. That's why he told us to walk in love. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them who hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Amen. When I walk in love, I am in control. Yes. I'm, the one that's, I'm the one that's calling the shots. If I walk in love towards you, no matter how you treat me, right. no matter how, what's going on in the world, no matter if the winds and the waves, it doesn't make any difference. My relationship with God is based on His love for me by Him giving His Son. The cross is unchangeable. The message of God's love, the message of what He thinks of me, the destiny that He placed before me, the purpose that He placed before me is set in stone. It will not change. Not by circumstances. Circumstances will change. No matter what your circumstances are, they will change. But God's love for you and, and His message to you through His Son, I love you, I accept you, you are my child. Amen. And I have taken responsibility. I am your possession. I am your exceeding great reward. I am your shield. That's what God's message is. If we're not, we're blown about by every wind and wave. I can't determine my relationship with God by the way things are going. I have to keep my faith in His Son. 
I have to keep my faith in his finished work. I have to keep my faith in the new creation that he placed inside of me. I have to keep my faith in the truth of God's word. That's what determines my life. That's what makes me a success. He always causes me to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Everywhere I go, I let people see Jesus. I let people catch a whiff of the aroma of Christ, my great high priest, and the aroma and the fragrance that comes from the sanctuary of heaven, the Holy Ghost coming inside of me and making me like Jesus. That's what Christianity is all about. It's not whether I have the favor of a, a great parking place or every light is green when I go across town or I'm in Dave's Lane on the highway and nobody gets in my way or everything works out great and everybody, you see what I'm talking about? If, we, if it's determined by circumstances and the way things are going, then the enemy, can, he can enter into our inner council. He can mess with our minds. That's why we have to be settled in the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. Amen. He didn't say you shall know about the truth. Because the truth is a person. And the word know there is to be intimate with the truth. The person who is the truth. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free having an intimate and close relationship with your Savior, with a person of Jesus, that is what makes you free. Amen. You can walk in freedom. My daughter-in-law, you know, if you keep doing the same thing and you're expecting different results, what do they call that? Insanity. That's exactly right. So my daughter-in-law, bless her heart, I love her. She'd been frustrated. She told me. She, she actually told me and began to weep when she told me. She said, I, 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 I just, I, it, it just wasn't working. You know, I knew I was saved. But she said, I never felt worthy. I never felt like, you know, I could enter God's presence. I just, I just felt like I wasn't measuring up. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she said, you know, she said, I decided that I needed to study the Bible with my husband. So instead of watching The Bachelor, <laughs> all those really successful people in Hollywood, yeah, you know, yeah. Those people that really have it together out there. Yeah. Oh, man. She said, I decided to study the Bible with my husband. You know, that's biblical. The Bible says the husband's supposed to wash, wash his wife with the water of the word, share the, share the word, share the, the knowledge of God with his wife. It's supposed to be a partnership, you know. He's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the home. You know, and so she became willing. She said, you know, he, he walks in victory. I'm, I'm going I'm to see what this is all about, you know. And I know Deidre would go to church. She'd get, and I'm going to call her name. I hope she don't watch this on, on the internet. But she said, I, you know, she'd go to church and get blessed, you know, and just and feel the presence of God. But how many of you know you can go to church and get blessed and walk out and just fall flat on your face Amen. if you don't know the truth, yes. if you're not intimate with the truth? And you can be not, not be free. You can experience the presence of God because you're a child of God, yet not walk in victory. That's right. You know? This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That's what the scripture says. So if you're not walking in confidence and faith, you know, you're going you're gonna to feel like a failure. You're not going to see yourself as a victor. You're not going to see yourself as triumphant in Christ. So she said, I just, I went into the bedroom with my husband after we put the kids to bed. Instead of watching TV, we got the Bible out and started studying the Bible. And we began to study in Galatians, the second chapter, where it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life I live now, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And she said, she asked Joey, she said, oh, no, Joey asked her, said, do you understand what justification means? Do you understand what that word means? It means acquittal. 
You know what it means to be acquitted? If it does not fit, you must acquit. You remember that? <laughs> declare not guilty. Amen. And she said, I suddenly realized that I had been declared not guilty by God. And all those feelings of guilt and condemnation and shame were lies. And the lie was replaced by the truth of God's word. And she said, I began to weep and realize that this is who I am. Amen. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the sacrifice of the Son of God. My faith is in Him. It's the Lamb that's worthy. And I'm united with Him, one with Him. I'm blameless before God. I'm acquitted. I'm declared not guilty. There is no condemnation for me. Amen. See, that's what we need to realize is that, that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We don't need to condemn people that are in the process of being transformed. Amen. I'm not talking about people that are playing games and blowing smoke and saying that they have a relationship with God and they're not committed to God or living for God at all. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that really have faith in Christ Jesus as their Lord. And they are in the process of being changed from glory to glory. You know, the Word of God is a seed that enters into your heart. And we need to help people with their seed. We need to cultivate that. We need to water that seed in their life. So the, trans the process of transformation takes place in their life. How many of you were perfect when you got born again? When you got born again, you were just a completely perfect person. Didn't need any more transformation. I, I, I needed lots of transformation. You know why? Because when you're born again, God transforms your heart. Your spirit's born again. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. But guess what? You spend a whole lifetime in this world being pressed into their mold and being twisted and shaped in iniquity. And your mind is not right with God. Your mind thinks a different way. God's got to transform your soul. He's got to restore your soul. He's got to transform the way you think and the way you believe. And then as you do, then your behavior begins to change. I remember in my own life how my behavior changed. But it didn't change all at one time. It was a process. And we need not to condemn people or even ourselves be under condemnation if there are areas in our life that still needs transformation. We need to keep ourselves exposed to an intimate relationship with God, exposing ourselves to His Spirit and to His Word and to the ministry gifts and to the gifts of the Holy Ghost and to the preaching of God's Word. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. He's talking to Christians there. He's talking about the seat of who you are. The part of your being that makes you who you are. Makes Johnny, Johnny. And Brother Allen, Brother Allen. And me, me. And Kenny, Kenny. It makes That's who your soul is. See, God doesn't want to destroy your individuality. He said to deny yourself. Don't put yourself first. See, there are parts of you that God is going to remove. He's going to remove. He's going to... And you're to put off things. Did you know that? You're to put off things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing you put off the old man. Let him that stole steal no more. See, that's the stuff we put off. It says for us to put it off. It says for us to receive the engrafted word. There's an old tree out behind my slaughterhouse, my locker plant, my processing plant, if slaughterhouse is too, too vivid for you. I'm a murderer, I am. I shed a lot of blood in my time. Not men's blood. Anyway. But they got this old tree back there. And, and, and it's, it's, it's an odd looking tree. It kind of reminds me of the work that God does in our life. See, your, your spirit's born again. Instantly. If, if you're born again and you die, instantly you go into His presence and the transformation takes place just like this. The spirits of just men are made perfect. And then you await the immortality and the changing of your body when Jesus comes back. But in the meantime, if you're still here, it's like that old tree. And it was grafted and planted there by a man named Tom Buckley. 
I've never seen another tree like it except in my uncle's pasture across the road. I think they all grafted them at the same time. The stump is hickory. And the top of the tree is pecan. So the base of the tree is small because hickory grows slower. And the pecan tree is big. It's the oddest looking tree you'd ever see. And that's kind of like us. God takes us and our soulish area, the part of you that makes you who you are, the individual person that you are, your likes, your dislikes, your disposition, your personality, all those things are part of your soul. They're the seed of who you are. And, and, and the only way to separate it is by the power of God and, and the word of God. But they function together. Your spirit and your soul function together. And so what God does, he engrafts his word into your soul and it begins to take on that appearance of a new man that grafted part of God's word enters in and intertwines into your personality and the Bible calls it the new man walking in newness of life Raised together with him. See, we died to our sins. We died in our relationship to sin. You know, and Jesus took away our sins, our individual sins. And then he quickened us together with Christ. That's our spirit. And raised us up together. Raised us up together. And made you a new creature. And is restoring your soul. Which is able, the Bible says, to save your soul. You know, you, you're going you're gonna to worship God. The Bible says you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what it says that? The Bible talks about your mind. The mind of the flesh is death. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace you see if we're not we've been trained along the lines of the law to be law doers to be rule keepers that mind is death that mind does not produce life and peace I'm talking about you keeping rules and laws in order for you to make a good relationship and good favor with God. It doesn't work like that. There's nothing that you can do that earns God's favor. There's no law that you can keep that will transform you. None whatsoever. But the mind of the Spirit, in other words, you're relying on the power and grace of the Holy Spirit in order for you to be empowered to walk and to please God. You can't even love without the Holy Ghost. The Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost that is given us. We're totally and completely dependent upon God. The Bible says, I love this scripture. The Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith. It didn't say by grace were you saved. That wasn't something that happened back yonder. It says by grace are you saved. In other words, the experience that you had when you were born again was a supernatural experience. You didn't earn it. There's nothing you could do. You couldn't pray enough. You couldn't work enough. You couldn't read your Bible enough. You couldn't keep the Ten Commandments enough to be born again. It was a gift of God. That's what the Bible said. It is the gift of God. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In other words, right now you are saved by grace through faith. Right now. In other words, I'm still saved by grace through faith. 
In other words, it's like Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. I'm still dependent upon the life force that flows from the throne of God, like the river that flows from the throne of God. I am still continually at all times, every day, every hour, every minute, every second, I'm dependent upon his life force flowing from the vine into this branch. I am not independent of him. And that's how I live in victory. That's how I overcome the world, is by his power. That's what the Bible talks about when it says that the promise of the Spirit. He talks about Abraham, the promise that God made to Abraham that he never received in this life. He only had a promise of it. Was the Spirit. The supply of the Spirit is the promise that God made to Abraham that you and I enjoy today it's the continual presence, the wellspring of life, the wellspring springing up into everlasting life. That's what it is, an artesian well that lives inside of you that gives you life. And guess what? You're not supposed to drink from any other well. The Bible says, do not hew out cisterns. Do not drink out of cisterns, says God. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. You have a wellspring of life living inside of you. It continually imparts life to you to empower you to live a victorious Christian life. It's not a pump. It's a spring. The law was a pump. Anyway, i got to get back to my daughter-in-law before I run out of time. And she said, I suddenly saw it. I suddenly saw that it didn't depend on me. But it depended upon Jesus and what he did for me. And he ever lives to make intercession for those that come to God by him. Amen. In other words, his presence at the throne of God is the intercession that brings continual life. His presence because I'm in Him. I'm connected to Him. He's the vine. I'm the branch. He lives. I live also. Isn't that what He said? Because I live, you shall live also. And she found the secret. And she stood in front of me and she wept. And she wept and cried and broke. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing that we can stand. I was telling Brother Allen today. We were, we were in Shreveport together. I was telling Brother Allen today. It's amazing that there is such truth in the Word of God. Such power and revelation and truth. And yet people can stand in the presence of it and not grasp it. Except by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to have a revelation. You have to see she became hungry. She became hungry for a revelation from God. Jesus said, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Spiritual hunger is the key to receiving from God. We should never be satisfied completely and totally. We should stay hungry for God at all times. I want to share one more testimony with you. And I did fix my truck. It wasn't easy, but I fixed my truck. Thank God, I could have killed myself. I could have had a wreck. I mean, that thing could have fell out on the highway, and I do about, I don't keep the speed limit on the interstate. You know, before I know it, I'm doing 90 miles an hour, especially if I have some hot rod beside me who thinks he can outrun my truck. I looked up the other day, I was doing 90 miles an hour down the interstate. Thank God there wasn't no state cops around. <laughs> oh, oh well but my son uh, he called me the other day I want a quick testimony I can get it out in about three minutes he said dad Deidre's stepmother has collapsed and they're rushing her to the hospital and we want you to pray and uh 
So they took her to the hospital and they opened her up and they took out about three liters of, li of fluid on the inside of her chest cavity and they sewed her up and they gave her a 10% chance to live. And they put her on life support and she coded about four times. And I started praying and I do most of my praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues. And uh, you know, when I got off the phone, I started praying. And I prayed from Lafayette to Forest Hill, or about eight, around exit 66 down there coming back this way. That's halfway mark between Lafayette and exit. When I got there, I started laughing in the spirit. I called Joey, I said, Joey, I, I prayed in the Holy Spirit until I got to uh, Forest Hill. I said, I, I believe I got a breakthrough. He said, well, Dad, I was praying and reading my Bible, and he said, the version I was reading in Psalms 22, when I got to it, it said, it is finished. And he said, I closed my Bible. I said, that's it. God's done it. God's done it. So he, he, and she was in grave condition. Grave condition. They, they weren't expecting her to live. So the family, they rush up there, you know. And, and, and they're all gathered around. Joey went in and took some oil and anointed her with oil in the name of the Lord and prayed for her. From that moment, she began to improve. They opened her back up again and took seven liters of fluid out of her chest cavity. Now I told Brother Adam this, I never told anybody else this, but I felt impressed that it was her gallbladder that was the problem. They, were, they thought it was her pancreas. They were wanting to remove her pancreas. I did not want them to remove her pancreas. I just felt that in the spirit when I was praying. Well, they removed her gallbladder. Somebody said, how come God didn't take her? I don't know. I don't understand why God didn't take her gallbladder out. All I know is you just have to go with the flow. Right. Amen? Amen? Don't ask no questions. Just obey God. Right. And so they sewed her back up. And guess what? She started improving. 10% chance to live. Started improving. Took her off of life support. And she just keeps getting better and better. And, you know, Deidre told me, she said, I want, I want this to be a testimony to my dad. Because my dad's not a believer. But he asked us to pray. So obviously he had a little faith, didn't he? So she said, I want my daddy to be saved. I want him to go to heaven. You know what? God does too. He loves everybody. Died for everybody. But I just wanted to give you that testimony of the goodness of God. Now, and I got one minute left. I'm going to give you another testimony. I'm just full of testimony. I just love. I just love. And God answers prayer. I told I, I don't like carpenter work. I don't like plumbing work. I don't like any of that kind of stuff. And I've been working on this house out there about as long as Brother Allen's been working on his house. My house don't look near as good as his does because I'm not near the carpenter. He is. And plus, I've had some shoddy carpenters helping me along the way. But anyway, it's livable. So once it got livable, I quit working on it. I don't have no running water out there. I just bring a 50-gallon drum of water out there in, a, in one of them food-grade drums, and I bring a couple of coolers, and, you know, and I have enough out there to drink, make coffee, and pour water on my head if I mow the grass and get sweaty, and sometimes I just come on home. But anyway, it's got an air conditioner in it, and my daughter, I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't feel like working on this house no more. Please send someone to help me. I need some help. And... Uh, I said, Lord, I need water out here, and you know, I, I, I just, you know, I just, I just don't feel like fooling with it. And I said, my place, I had dozer work done out there, and I said, I need, you know, it needs to be bush hogged. And I said, I don't, I don't have a tractor, and you know, I'm gonna have to go rent a tractor and bush hog my place. And, and, and I got a phone call, and it was my daughter. She lives in upstate New York. She said, Daddy, it's just too cold up here. She said, Me and my husband want to move back to Louisiana, and we were just wondering if you might let us stay in your house. I said, well, baby, I don't have no water out there. She said, that's no problem. We're going to run water. I said, and it's not completely finished. That's no problem. My husband's a carpenter, a plumber, an electrician. He's going to take care of all that for you. I'm like, well, praise God. I said, y'all can stay out there for two years free. And I said, if I ever need to sleep, I'll just throw me a mattress on the, on the living room floor and sleep. And he told me, he said, he called me dad. He said, dad, he said, uh, I'll, I'll bush hog your place for you, put a fence around it, and, and, and I'll take care of it for you. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't God good? See, I don't want to fool with it. That's bad, isn't it? I don't want to fool with it. But anyway, God sent. I just wanted to give you that testimony tonight. And I'm through. And God bless you. I just want to inspire you to believe God. I want to inspire you to put your trust in God. 
who, who raises the dead, the Bible says. I want, you to, I want to inspire you to trust Him. I want to inspire you to pray. I want to inspire you to believe. I want to inspire you to step out and trust God. And you'll bring Him glory. You'll glorify the Lord. Thank Amen. you for that. Amen.